So in this video, we will check out number five. It's from the 2017 AP Calc AB exam. It's a non-calculator question that involves two particles that are moving along the x-axis. And on the interval from zero to eight, what we have access to is we have access to a position function for particle P that holds at any time T between zero and eight. And then we have access to a velocity function for particle Q that holds on the same interval. They do provide us with an initial position of particle Q. It's at five on the x-axis at time zero. Part A says, when is particle P moving to the left? So if you think about what indicates the direction that the particle is moving, that's always gonna be indicated by uh, whether its position is increasing. If its position is increasing, it's moving to the right. If its position is decreasing, it's moving to the left. And Questions about increasing and decreasing would be answered by analyzing a derivative. And the derivative of position is velocity. So if velocity is negative, our particle is moving to the left. And so we are going to have to generate a velocity function from this position function. That's easy. It's just the rate of change of velocity. So it's, excuse me, it's the rate of change of position velocity is. And so a quick derivative of this position function is going to be how we begin part A. And if you take the derivative of this position function, outer function's natural log, the derivative of natural log of t would normally be 1 over t. Well, we're using a chain rule because we see this great big inner function here. So we put the inner function in place of the t in that denominator. And then we're going to multiply by the derivative of that polynomial to finish off our chain rule. If you just multiply these two fr fractions together, 1 over this polynomial times this quantity over one. Here's what that fraction simplifies to. And now you need to think how you're going to determine when velocity is negative. So, so what I thought is it makes sense to kind of try to build a sign chart here. If, if I can build a sign chart, I can show in that sign chart where velocity is negative and where velocity is positive. So when we construct a sign chart, we need to know when the quantity that we're building the sign chart for has the opportunity to change signs. And a quantity is only ever going to have the opportunity to change signs if it's first equal to zero or first undefined. So when is this velocity function going to be undefined? Well, that's only if the numerator of the velocity function is equal to zero. So if you set that numerator equal to zero, add two, divide by two, you get that the numerator is equal to zero when time is one. So velocity is equal to zero when t is one. When is the velocity function undefined? Now that seems like a weird question. We think about velocity, usually velocity is always defined. Uh, but if you set this denominator equal to zero, you're going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage since there's no calculator. Usually we like to see this thing factor. In this case, this is a prime polynomial. So if we break out the quadratic formula here, what you'll notice is under the root, we have four minus 40 negative 36, we're going to get imaginary solutions. This denominator is actually always going to be positive. So we, we considered it. We don't get anything else that has to go into the sign chart as a potential value where the velocity can change signs. So the only time velocity is going to have the opportunity to change signs is as we pass through the t of 1. And if you pick a test value from this section of the number line, 0 to 1, pick a value like 1 half, 2 times 1 half, is 1, minus 2 is negative 1, divided by something that we've already said is always going to be positive, is going to give you a negative velocity there. And then between 1 and 8, if you pick a test value from this stretch of the number line, like 5, 2 times 5 minus 2, well, we're looking at a positive divided by something that's always positive, so we're looking at a positive velocity. So where is the particle moving to the left? What well, we said early on, it's going to be moving to the left if the velocity is negative, and that happens on the interval from 0 to 1. In part B, it wants us to find all times during which the two particles travel in the same direction. And if the particles are traveling in the same direction, the, the velocities of each will be the same sign. And so we've already analyzed the sign of the velocity for particle P. So I just copy and pasted this sign chart from part A into this new page here. But I also wanted to analyze the sign of the velocity of particle Q. And so I, I basically now need to build a sign chart for the velocity of particle Q. So when is the velocity of particle Q going to have the opportunity to change signs? Well, it's first got to be equal to zero 
or undefined. This is always defined, this polynomial is. So I just set this velocity equal to zero. This one did factor, and we end up with t equal five being the value that makes this equal to zero, and t equals three making this second factor equal zero. So the velocity of particle q has the opportunity to change signs twice. It could change signs at three, it could change signs at five. We do our testing from each section of the number line. If you pick a value here like two, 2 minus 5 is negative, 2 minus 3 is negative, negative times a negative, positive for that entire stretch of the velocity function for particle q between 0 and 3. What about a value here like 4? Well, 4 minus 5 is negative, 4 minus 3 is positive, negative positive product is going to give us a negative result. And then on the other side of 5, between 5 and 8, this factor is positive, this factor is positive. We're dealing with a positive velocity there for particle Q. So just kind of compare the sign charts. Where are the velocities going to be the same sign? Well, definitely not between 0 and 1 because the velocity of particle Q is positive, but then from 1 to 3, the objects are going to be moving the same direction, right? Velocity of particle Q is positive, velocity, excuse me, the velocity of particle P is positive, and the velocity of particle Q remains positive from 1 the rest of the way to 3. So 1 to 3, we have the same sign, the objects are moving the same direction. And then again, from five the rest of the way to eight, both velocities are back to being positive. So I've just written up that conclusion at the bottom of the screen right here, one to three, five to eight. In part C, they ask us about the acceleration of particle Q at time two. And if you think about how you need to go about computing this, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So we take the derivative of the velocity function for particle Q. Pretty easy derivative of that polynomial. We're just going to get 2t minus 8. What is the acceleration at time 2? Well, 2 times 2 minus 8, which gives us negative 4. So the acceleration of particle Q is negative 4 units per time squared at the t value of 2. They ask us a follow-up question. Is the speed of the particle increasing, decreasing, or neither at time 2? Explain your reasoning. So what I did is, is I thought about sketching a little piece of the velocity graph for particle Q. So I went ahead and did a quick calculation up here. The velocity of particle Q at time 2 is positive 3, and I know the acceleration is negative 4. Well, that tells me that my velocity graph for particle Q has to go through this point, 2 for t, 3 for velocity, but then the acceleration graphically is always going to represent the slope of a tangent line. If my slope is negative 4 as I pass through this point, my velocity has to be going downward toward a value of 0, and if you define speed to be the absolute value of velocity. If velocity is moving closer to zero, closer to the t-axis, you know the speed of the particle is gonna have to be decreasing there. So because of the positive velocity and the negative acceleration, the speed of the particle is approaching zero, or you can just use the, the justification that I had here. Uh, speed is decreasing since the velocity is approaching zero at time two. Last part of number five says find the position of particle Q the first time it changes directions. Well, back in part B, we figured out what the velocity sign chart looked like for particle Q. And that sign chart indicated that the first change in direction, the first sign change for velocity, happened at time three. So we basically need to know what the position of particle Q is at time three. Well, we know what the position of particle Q is at time zero. So that can be our starting point. And we would have to add on how much the position of particle Q changes by between zero, when it was at this point, and three, the time when we want to determine the position, by integrating the rate of change of position. And the rate of change of position is velocity. So if you carry out this computation with the fundamental theorem of calculus, you need an antiderivative of this velocity function. So power rule applied to each piece of the velocity function for particle Q gives us this. We then would need to toss in our limits of integration and take a difference. You can leave this as your final answer if you want to, right? You don't necessarily have to simplify these non-calculator free response results. Uh, I did go ahead and, and try to piece everything together here and it worked out to 23, but you can definitely box up 
what is right here and you don't have to go ahead and finish off with the 23 as you see on my screen.